Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Between Two Consultants. My name is Ethan Silvers. I'm Nicholas Kelly. And I am very excited to have a returning guest back with us um, on this episode where we're going to be talking about cloud and hybrid cloud strategies. Um, it's something that's been going on for a little while, and we're now really starting to get into the details and weeds of how to do it in a uh, in, in really the the proper way. Um, so, Ilya, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. My name is Ilya Tsapin. I lead architecture practice at Logic 2020. Excited to be here. And I, I've worked, and so has Nick, many times with Ilya, um, and his dry wit is very much appreciated on this show. Uh, and, and Nick and I will do our best to keep up with you, Ilya. Um, so just to start with, um, Ilya, around cloud strategy and hybrid cloud strategies. Um, when an organization is looking to do one or the other or both, what are things to consider? Well, it's an interesting question. And it's a little bit of an oxymoron because when you talk about cloud, it's all about agility and flexibility. And this is the key thing that uh, you need to consider when you try to move to the cloud. Every decision is not finite. You are not putting yourself in a position that um, you are locked to a specific provider and there is no way out for you, right? Also think about this as an ability to create more and more experience, experiments in different areas. So again, it's all about uh, ability to evolve, experiment, change, and be ready to make mistakes. So it's not kind of signing legal document. This is the, the strategy that we must go and nothing else is irrelevant for us by no means. Awesome. Ilya, I want to pick up on a couple of things you said there. You were, you were touching on some of the benefits. And, and I want to ask you like the specific benefits you see uh, towards moving to the cloud. But firstly, I just want to note, <clears throat> I'm very familiar with cloud. I grew up in Ireland and there are <laughs> really a lot of clouds there. And also, I'm about an hour south of, of Seattle and it's obviously a cloudy place. And maybe later we could talk about why are some of the biggest cloud providers in the Seattle region, uh, is there any clar correlation to what's going on with the climate and the weather in the area? But first, before we get into that, um, if you could just carry on a little bit about the, the benefits of moving to the cloud. Um, as I mentioned, benefit number one, cloud, if you do it right, is forgiving. If you move to the wrong direction, you can assess, you can regroup, you can tear down whatever you already created and create something uh, that more aligned with your particular use case. Another thing, security. There is a tendency to think that, okay, if you're in the cloud, you are less secure comparing when you are on-prem. I would say it's a misperception. It's a matter of how you configure your configuration on-prem, how you configure your uh, system in the cloud. It could be highly secure in the cloud. It could be very vulnerable on-prem. All that applies. Um, third thing, it's all about scalability. With the cloud, you have this virtual infinite scaling, and you have ability to mm, deliver very large applications with a minimal effort from your side. The first component is um, a managed services that cloud providers are giving you. Because, I mean, traditionally we started to think about cloud like, I can spin up a number of virtual machines and expand my data center with it. It is, became a knowledge that this is just the first step. After that, 
people understood and cloud providers understood that they could provide managed services for you on top of this bare minimal uh, offering. They provide uh, managed services such as like Kafka streaming or managed database instances, all these components which make your life as a developer much easier because you don't have to worry about it. Bear in mind, it comes with a cost. Uh, yes, you can optimize your cost with the cloud and you can adjust scale, but there is no point of time we should be saying that cloud in general is cheaper to what you have on-prem. I wouldn't say it's an accurate statement because it's too vague and it's too general. It's uh, different from case by case. There are situations when moving workload to the cloud is cheaper comparing to having it on-prem. Sometimes it is definitely not. But the upside is that you obtain the agility that you could not possibly get while you're doing the on-prem. A few, a few things um, that you <clears throat> brought up that I, I'd love to go into, and I'm looking forward, uh, Nick, to get back to talking about the physical clouds. Um, you know, we could even talk about what our favorite clouds are. Mine is Nimbulus. Serious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the, the most interesting question I'll ask, and I'll ask two, the first is, Ilya, how honored are you that we have allowed you to come back on our episode, on our show for the second time? Uh, with some hesitation, I thought that my first show was not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> and hesitation meaning, I mean, guys, you basically were up to my quality levels. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that in this one, we're even surpassing that. <laughs> well, yes, there, we need to obtain more numbers to have a more firm statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the statistics are bearing out. Like after you came on, Ilya, we jumped from 3 million viewers to 3 million and one. Um, and I'm going to guess that might have been your mom. Um, so the uh, next question, Ilya, is you mentioned getting locked into a specific provider. And I've, I've heard that mentioned by several different organizations of a con uh, that that is a concern of theirs. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of how to avoid it or whether you want to avoid it or, hey, I'm getting locked in, but it's actually I'm getting locked in with the right with the right provider. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, two things. First, in general, you have a capability to design applications when the lock-in is minimum, right? If you use Kubernetes, sorry for my dogs. Uh, <laughs> well, I, Nick, I wish I could say that uh, this is a new experience for us, but um, I've had the exact same thing with my cats. Based on the bark of the dog, I'm guessing, what is that? Is that a Great Dane or a Doberman Pinscher? It's two French Bulldogs. Oh. <laughs> and they're puppies, so they're... Oh. Anyways, uh, so, um, yeah, if you use, for example, Kubernetes, there is a portion of your application which could, which could be deployed to any cloud, private or public, doesn't really matter, right? Uh, there are, exactly as you said, you can make a decision that this cloud particular, this particular cloud provider is optimal for you and you kind of invest in that lock-in. So you start to use their cloud services more and more, uh, especially managed services. But again, if you uh, create, your, uh, create your application right and you externalize configuration, you treat your um, storage as a detachable component as well as logs and everything, it will be not a complicated exercise to move from one cloud to another. Let me get these ones out of the room. I'm sorry. Perfect. Nick, I think you and I, I mean, we, you and I can probably talk at it for hours and hours and days and days about best practices for cloud whether it be cloud migration or Nimbulous clouds. 
Um, Call yeah. them as clouds. I don't like clouds that bring the rain, for example. Yeah, yeah, not my favorite either. I, I prefer the clouds that never show up at all. Agreed. Funny. <laughs> Ilya, did you, you, you put away your, uh, your guard dogs, your French yep. bulldog guard dogs? They are safely locked outside. <laughs> Protecting the family from danger. Uh, Nick, where were we before the uh, before the before we were interrupted? So, Ilya, I have a question that's going to the heart of the topic here. What is the difference between hybrid cloud and cloud? One is a subset of another, right? <laughs> um, so this is the way we look at it. There are private cloud providers. There are public cloud providers. Example of the public cloud would be like Azure or AWS or GCP. Uh, private cloud providers, example, would be VMware, um, Nutanix probably, um, IBM. The difference is the private cloud is, well, as it is, you have your infrastructure, you have your data center, and um, this virtualization is settled on top of uh, that bare metal solution that you've got. Public cloud is something that is well, accessible by everyone, right? Where you can create your own account, your subscription, set up your networking components and all that but it is available for multiple tenants uh, and it could be the case that on one server you will have multiple clients uh, leveraging different virtual machines uh, but completely unaware of each other. And so Ilya, when you're looking at public versus private, um, what are some of the top considerations uh, of of how to use one or the other. I, I would imagine part of it has to do with regulation, but I, but go ahead and talk us through that. I think, in my opinion, it's three different things. First consideration is cost, and uh, but it's not that straightforward, guys. For example, if you already invested in some data center and you already have virtualization on top of the, your bare metal machines over there. You don't want to rush and just go to a public cloud provider right away uh, because that's a, a great shiny object, right? Uh, you already invested in these components, so you need to find the optimal way for using it. Uh, the other thing is uh, ability to calculate the cost for the public cloud. and. To some degree, it's an interesting exercise because you need to figure out and predict your workloads and uh, estimate your billing and see how that would work. Third component is a game around uh, IPEX and CAPEX, right? What, where your budget is coming from? Is it an investment? Is it operational expenses? Um, to your point about regulations, well, yeah, that could be the part of the consideration, but a lot of regulations could be uh, fulfilled uh, leveraging a public cloud provider. And I would and I would also say if government is using cloud right now already for their government and military purposes, uh, it proves by itself that um, they could be used for very touchy uh, operations that needs to be really secure. Awesome. Ilya, you touched on some of the, the benefits as well for, for the hybrid approach. Uh, particularly, I think the OPEX and CAPEX one is, is quite interesting. What is your take on the benefits of just going with the, the hybrid cloud approach? Well, hybrid... I mean, there is a, so we talked about private cloud, we talked about public cloud. Hybrid, as a definition, is a mixture between two. You uh, work with one private cloud provider and one public cloud provider. Uh, because of that, 
obviously you have that flexibility from both flavors right you can balance between your um, capex and opex you can choose which workload needs to go in one area and which workload needs to go to another area depending on what you need and how you would manage that okay uh, so for every client it's a specific situation and i would say for every workload it's a specific situation and again um, signing up for a public cloud is not a, a complicated work effort it is from my experience as a consultant it is much more complicated from the inside of the company to feel comfort <laughs> in moving your workloads to the cloud rather than any technical difficulties of doing that. Basically, you need to get a sign off from your security team. Uh, you need to uh, set up the processes and rules. All these components needs to be in place, right? Uh, but it's more internal pro problem rather than technical problem working with the cloud provider. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So, Ilya, that was the, the hybrid cloud, benefits of hybrid cloud you addressed. Um, yep. Ethan, you're up next to a question five, yep. if that one works for you. I'm not going to do that one. Um, Ilya, what if a client were to come to you and say, hey, we're thinking of doing like the hybrid of hybrids and we want to do public, private and on-prem? What, what would you say to them? I would say this is a perfect option. <laughs> Do you hear that, Nick? Do you hear that? <laughs> I just worth, nailed don't, it. Don't limit yourself, but look at this from a workload perspective. For each workload, you need to find and define your optimal scenario. Don't think about it as a general solution, like every workload must be present here and there. It will be a waste of time and wasted money. So, and, and I like this idea of, of splitting everything by workload because that is that reflects the work structure of the organization, right? So people are focused on specific areas. It reflects infrastructure related to a specific uh, business goal that it serves as an application. And it also provides a transparency from a budgetary perspective, like how money had been spent uh, for these components of the project in the perspective of this business goal and these business capabilities. So Nick, if you don't mind, I, I, I just, I'd want to um, dive down into uh, what Ilya was just saying. Do I, do I have your permission to continue along this line? Yes, permission granted. Oh, thank you. Woo! I was, Ilya, you have no idea how much I was sweating that. <laughs> um, you, you brought up um, splitting it out by workload. And I, I think that's a really interesting way to frame it um, in regards to whether we're talking about hybrid of public versus private or hybrid uh, and that including on-prem. So when you talk about splitting it up by workload, if you could go into details or maybe provide examples um, of, of how, what that means to split it up by workload. Well, think about it. You have your um, CRM application, which is a monolith that sits outside for you. The CRM application is connected to your custom application that uh, manages um, data to create orders and these orders will be sent to your third component uh, on the warehouse, right? Uh, I will look at these three blocks and I will say, okay, my middle tier, be a custom application that's been created. Uh, let's assume it's been created with all modern patterns like microservices deployable into uh kubernetes has all messaging pops up components all that it serves one single need 
to obtain information from the CRM and communicate that to the warehouse. Why we have a custom application in the middle? That's a different story, but it's a live scenario. Okay. Uh, for me, that's a workload. It will it will include multiple microservices and each of them will have its own configuration structure and everything. But the ultimate business goal of this uh, of this block of applications serve one single business the business goal. And that's why it will be treated as a separate workload end to end. And then for this workload, as I mentioned, we can consider that one part of it could be residing on prem, some of it could reside in a private cloud, some of it could reside in the public cloud. Ilya, that's great. And I just want to key off one other piece on the, the workload. You had mentioned it's more naturally aligned to how the business is structured, you know, for the, the examples you were giving there. Um, what amount of what consideration do you give to the people aspects of it? Is, is it a major concern for you that you know, the workloads are more understandable by people um, so that they're more on board? And do, also, do you see like a, a significant risk when doing such a migration from the people perspective? Well, I mean, you have to have alignment between skill set and technology. If there is a significant, significant misalignment over there, it will not flop. You also, shame, shameless advertisement, might need to ask experts to come and set up some processes and guardrails over there and to teach people with some of the components of the new technologies they are not get used to. Uh, so, of course, you... Uh, want to pick up the technologies the team is uh, familiar with and can work with. Uh, equally, that should not limit you for a larger picture. You can start augmenting your team with the experts. You can put, uh, put people into training sessions and uh, make sure that they are aware about the newest trends. And I'm sure they will appreciate it and they will look at this as a some kind of um, recognition that the company values them and uh, because the company wants them to be successful with these new technologies they are picking up. I think that's a really interesting point, uh, Nick. I, I thought it was um, a surprisingly really great question. Um, and uh, so, and, and this might be a whole, this could be a whole nother episode of how when you figure out, hey, this is actually the right solution for our needs, and then comparing that to this is how heavy of a lift it's going to be in terms of our current resources to support that, and what is the right balance there of figuring out this is the best solution, this is what our people can support, and then trying to like make that match because it's it's a it's a really big consideration like uh, Nick was bringing up. Ilya, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if it's just too broad to talk to. Well, I mean, just I wouldn't think about people as a uh, permanent uh, variable there mm -hmm. because the skill set of the team is a subject to change as well, right? You have your turnover, you have new hires, you can, you you expect that uh, the skill set of the developers and skill set of the team in general is fluid as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and keeping that in mind, there are areas where you can challenge your team and say, like, hey guys, this is what you've been doing for ten years. We keep doing this, but this is another area to uh, for us to strive for. Uh, we have options to go there. We should not limit ourselves. Yeah, it's interesting if, about the, the resources, um, you know, moving on and sort of, you know, that, that being like almost like a pendulum. Um, and Logic 2020 has been trying to get rid of me and Nick for a long time. Uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll see when that happens. Uh, back to you, Nick. Yeah, so I just related to that, uh, the point you were making, Ilya. Um, 
So why is it that there's so many cloud providers in the Pacific Northwest? And don't tell me there isn't a correlation with, with the clouds in the atmosphere. How oh, about average temperature? That is optimal for data centers. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the weather that people will stay indoors more and, and maybe not enjoy life, but also just come up with great <laughs> ideas and innovate. And that as well. That's I was wondering. <laughs> Did it have anything to do with, you know, starting in the 90s and the uh, grunge movement or the uh, coffee movement with Starbucks? I don't know. Is it all interrelated when a butterfly flaps its wings? The chaos that, theory. It's a very big question that I just asked. Please comment it. <laughs> Please comment. Uh, let's uh, yeah. just... Um, don't know. In the mist. <laughs> uh, getting back to the topic at hand, um, which of course is Nimulus Clouds. Um, but also putting that to the side. Ilya, if you could talk with us about the journey and the steps that are taking as, you know, from the um, conceptual and ideation phase into the actual uh, doing it. Um, I assume you're talking about the journey for cloud migration in general, right? Y yes, not about um, how Nimulus clouds are formed. That is correct. Good. Just making sure. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, it depends from cloud to cloud and from client to client, right? I can tell you about my personal experience as a consultant. In most of the cases, the client are clients are comfortable of moving forward by some POC MVP where they choose a specific workload that is supposedly to be a greenfield, or meaning something new that did not exist before, or an area where they truly struggle because of the lack of scalability. So they choose this area, then depending on the size of the client and their agility, it will be a huge conversation with their security team and networking team before the step one will be done. Step one is permission granted to move one byte of data from, let's say, on-prem to a public cloud. Um, setting up cloud, very minimal cloud infrastructure, like hierarchy of the accounts, separation of permissions, all these components needs to be done prior to everything else. And then uh, the POC to demonstrate the capability. Like this is our data that we are moving in. This is how it will be processed in the cloud right now. This is how we will report on top of that. For example, if we're talking about analytics solution, I know Nick would love that uh, aspect of it. This is how much it costs us per month for this workload. So that will give us some ideas how to extrapolate that uh, for a larger workloads. And then the next step is a roadmap. Okay, let's identify the rest of the workloads. Let's see how that uh, uh, how that could be handled. Let's tie that to a specific deadlines, timelines. Let's start onboarding the team and educate them how to move forward. Awesome. Okay. So Ilya, the, for the people that are watching this and they're, they maybe haven't dipped their toes into getting into the cloud or the hybrid cloud approaches, is there one key piece of advice you would give someone right at the start of that journey oh absolutely a lot of clients that i see they have this perception that oh we must um plan everything from the very beginning with a high level of details and until that planning and buy-in and sign off is completed we cannot really move forward remember client is a place for experimentation and client is forgiving if you do it right. Um, so don't be afraid to make your first steps not fully prepared. Uh, whenever you start doing it, it will benefit for you much more comparing to, okay, we need to know it, this inside out until we start uh, configuring our stuff. That will be my main advice. And I can't stress enough how many times I saw our clients basically got frozen 
in this analysis situation, let's play for everything prior we do anything. Analysis paralysis, something that we we do not have we do not have an issue with that on on this show. Sorry to interrupt you, Ilya. Keywords, yeah. I thought it's inappropriate, but looks like I'm in a good audience here. <laughs> <laughs> Ilya, if you were to um, provide a piece of advice on what not to do, like a big red X to a client of, okay, we can tell you do this, do this, do this. But under no circumstances will you want to do this. I mean, it's a conversation I have with my kids all the time. Um, well, obvious things. Security. Make sure that you don't uh, do stupid things. <laughs> right? This sounds like the advice I give to my children. Uh, well, what should I say? <laughs> they are very advanced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you give them the same advice as we give to established corporations, right? <laughs> um, second, a little bit on that note, uh, don't stick to what you already have on prem. Try to be open minded. Try to see if you can switch if you can use uh, your cloud migration as an opportunity to refresh your technological stack, uh, stack. Look at your licensing costs. See if there is an easy way to move from uh, solution A to solution B uh, from a licensing perspective on a fly while you're doing the migration. That's great. That's great advice, Ilya. They, we're coming there to the end of the session I wanted to make sure if there's anything that we, we missed or if there's anything else you would like to impart to folks that are starting the journey. Uh, one small technical aspect that we keep talking about with our clients, when it comes to public cloud or private cloud, yes, there is a technicalities and things that you need to consider about the infrastructure itself but the meat of the component the meat of the solution and the meat of the security is all about encryption and certificates if you think about it but then if you think about it, the next level it's all about how you automate your key rotation and your certificate rotation to make sure it is happening automatically and people are not involved in this process or involved in a minimal at a minimal scale because having your um, communication shell encrypted is one thing have an ability to uh, to rotate your keys let's say every 10 minutes that's another thing and this is one of the great advantages of the cloud solution and when it comes tricky when it becomes tricky when you have multiple clouds or when you have more complicated solutions you need to think how you will do this um encryption rotation in this particular use cases it still could be done but you think you need to think about it and you need to think about it carefully to avoid a lot of laborious and manual work it's a bit of a technical subject area but this is like three levels down in terms of level of details we discussed right now. Uh, and that could be in the area where, well, we as consultants, as an architecture practice can definitely help our clients. There's, um, you know, the last two things um, that I'd like to key in on is, uh, and first and most important is you said that my kids are advanced. Um, it's definitely uh, proof. It feels probably like you've met my kids and they are that way despite some very suspect parenting. <laughs> The uh, second uh, thing, and I, I really like what you said, is in this journey, don't miss this as a opportunity. Licensing, architecture, what is the right way to do our infrastructure? I think that's a really sound point, Ilya, um, and a, a really good way for folks who are going down this journey to think about it. Absolutely. and. Um... 
Yeah, it's a pity when people just go straight forward and do lift and shift and um, claim they move to the cloud just because they recreated whatever they had on prem over there and not benefit from a variety of services and uh, opportunities that cloud would be able to provide for them for a very small price by the way <laughs> I, I that that probably is a good place to leave it nick is there anything else uh, that you think we should cover yeah i just like the the, the piece Ilya, you said on getting started don't wait don't wait for everything to be absolutely perfect. Uh, it's good life advice, uh, just outside of cloud and hybrid cloud. So I appreciate <laughs> that. It's, it's really good takeaway. If uh, if there's anything that we can help um, the viewers with, please get in touch with any of us, um, Nick, Ilya, or myself. We'd be happy to um, try to point you in the right direction. Thanks, everybody, for joining. My name's Ethan Silvers. I'm Nicholas Kelly. And we'll I'm see you Ethan. on the next episode. Ilya, come on. If everybody knows who you are already, I appreciate. This isn't between two consultants and Ilya. <laughs> this is between two consultants. <laughs> All right, Ilya, fine. Ilya, here we go. Ilya, we'll, we'll do this again. I hope none of this gets edited. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. My name's Ethan Silvers. I'm Nicholas Kelly. Ilya, what is going on? I'm leaving this open for you to say your name. <laughs> Let's try this. Let's go uh, round three. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. My name's Ethan Silvers. I'm Nicholas Kelly. And I'm Ilya Tsapin. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Being a repeat guest, really appreciated. We'll see everybody on the next episode of Between Two Consultants. Catch Take you care. later. <laughs>